Good day, fellow deal makers. Welcome to the Deal Scout. On this show, we're going to talk about protecting your assets and we're going to talk about succession planning and legacy planning and all that. So, what we did is we scoured the earth looking for some attorneys and, and professionals to share their knowledge with us, fellow deal makers, on how to protect your deals. So, with that, Brad, welcome to the show, man. Brad, thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. Like, Absolutely. So, Brad, where do you hail from, sir? Right now, um, our office is located in Orange County, California, but I myself physically live in Las Vegas, Nevada. Oh, neat. Okay, got it. So uh, tell us a little bit. We're, we're hanging out at a coffee shop in Nevada, right? Yeah. And, uh, and someone comes up and they go, hey, Brad, who are you? What do you do? How do you typically introduce yourself? Great, great, great question. So I normally say that uh, I started, my father started the firm Barth Calderon back in 1992, and I started working with him back in 1997. So I'm on my 24th year of practice with my father, and it's just kind of uh, working with him. My father, prior to being a lawyer, he was a financial planner, one of the first financial planners in the country. And just over time, he became an attorney, and his business model went from servicing high net worth individuals who are typically business owners from a financial point of view and kind of rolled that over, over to a legal sense. So working with my dad, I had the, the honor and certainly the privilege of being able to work with a lot of high net worth clients over the years, business owners over the years throughout in all different segments of the of, uh, of sectors of business society, as well as all over the country. And through that, I've kind of have discovered an expertise in the areas of estate planning, asset protection planning, and again, having the benefit of working along with my father over these years, uh, I've basically been able to uh, work with him and, and, and work with a lot of clients in all kinds of areas, like I mentioned, from estate planning, succession planning, estate tax minimization planning. That's the kind of my journey. And uh, my father currently is uh, 74 years old. I have just turned 50. So I got to say, God willing, I have another 25 years ahead of me. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> so was it dad that got you into the business? Certainly. Yeah. I think that, I think that normally happens. Lawyers typically breed lawyers and that's kind of the saying. So, uh, yeah. So having, I, I, I wanted to be a pilot uh, when I was uh, in, in high school and my dad said, no, why don't you consider going into law? It's kind of the family business. And that was kind of my direction. So I'm certainly following on my father's coattails for sure. <laughs> what kind of pilot would you have been like, like test pilot or like fighter pilot? Yeah, well, pilot? yeah I, so certainly I when, I, when I was younger, I actually did go to Air Force military school. So I did have dreams back in those days of flying F-16s and F-15 fighter planes. But the reality is with my eyesight, it turns out uh, I'd be lucky if I can do cargo. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so that's, so, so what else do you do? If you can't yeah. fly, you become a lawyer. That's right. If you can't, if you can't fly, be a lawyer. That'd be a great marketing ad, right? Um, <laughs> Did you see the new Top Gun? This is off topic. Oh, great. It's great. I actually, I, I've, been using, I've been using a couple of quotes in my talks recently. Uh, I always, because he refers to miracle number one and miracle number two. And I actually been quoting that in that throughout my talks. I kind of love it. It's a great movie. I remember the first one when it came out back in 1988. And that was actually one of the years, no, 1986, I believe, or 84. I actually was in military school at that time. So it really kind of, and it was Air Force military school, so I certainly did kind of ring home. So I have a good passion for that movie. <laughs> yeah, great movie. I enjoyed that. Took my wife on a date for that. And uh, yeah, we, we really enjoyed it. I thought they did a great job giving the high five to Val and all the work that he's did. And uh, it was, I thought it was great. Absolutely. Anyways, Absolutely. Back, to, back to deals. So right. um, here we are. You, know, you, you, you got in the family business. You went to law school, and you've mm -hmm. been doing it for 24 years. So you've learned a lot and saw a lot, right? And I'm yep. sure there's some things that, that you've seen that surprised you, right? Yep. So over the last 24 years of you seeing estate planning, legacy planning, uh -huh. tax, what are some of the biggest changes that you saw that might be beneficial for deal makers to yes. hear? That's a great question and a great topic. Um, I have the privilege of being uh, one of the top speakers for an organization called Vistage. I'm not sure if you're familiar with who they are. Yeah. Vistage, YPO, uh, Tiger 21, these types of organizations. I kind of speak to these, these business owners. And one thing that always surprises me, um, and not to mention our own client base outside of those organizations, is the number of, of professionals who have all their ducks in a row on, from a business point of view, but they don't have a basic estate plan. And they spend all the time, effort, and energy focusing on the business itself. But yet when it comes to their personal assets, 
their personal legacy, their personal structuring, their personal succession plan, both at a business level and at a personal level, for some reason, that always seems to get put on the back burner. I believe there's a statistic that says like 30% of people don't have any kind of estate or succession planning. And I actually think that number is even, even a little higher when it comes to business owners. And I don't know why that is. So one of the big things that has shocked me over the years is just the number of people and the size of their organizations and the complexity of their organizations. And yet they don't have a basic estate plan or if they do, Josh, it's completely out of date. And one, so what's worse than not having a plan is having one that's out of date because that's one that's completely inconsistent with what someone's succession or testamentary desires may be. You may be better off not having one as opposed to having one that's completely no longer consistent with what your ultimate desires are. So that's kind of my biggest, my biggest shock over the, all the years I've been planning. And it still surprises me today. So that's surprising to me. Not, not the numbers. I bet you the statistics are crazy high because you got messy entrepreneurs. They they're in business and they finally find that work. So they double down on the business and you know, we, we become hyper-focused on making sure our business doesn't fail as an entrepreneur. That's how you get started. Don't die. Right. And then you, you start getting traction, making more money. And then you, you do investments and such like that. But you're, you're, for first generational businesses, it's very difficult to take your eye off that. Is, is that what your experience is? Yeah, yeah, that's right. They, they get, sometimes they get the, the, the proverbial tunnel vision. Yeah. They're so focused on what's happening right in front of them or just trying to, as a business owner, just trying to make payroll, trying to make this month's or this quarter's expenses. Sometimes they don't, they don't step away sometimes and think about the big picture from a personal point of view. And that goes beyond just simply state playing. It kind of crosses over what I think we'll probably give you getting to as far as their overall financial and asset protection plan as well. Because that's kind of the that's kind of the next level. You have your basic foundational estate planning stuff, but then then you got to focus on asset protection and liability and risk mitigation, which is part of that same discussion for my business owners. Yeah. So something that you said surprised me. It's better to not have one in some instances than to have an out of date one. The out of date, when could an out of date estate plan or will, living will, whatever the case may be, when could that hurt you or your family? Okay, okay great. So basically the, the, the question always comes up. So how long, how often should I review it? So let's just take the, the, the generic rule of thumb should be every five years. So let's just say you do have your basic estate plan, which comprises of a wills, powers of attorney for healthcare, powers of attorney for property management, um, and a trust. That's your basic components of an estate plan. So I tell my clients, they ask me, so when should we get in touch? When should we review it? And I say, well, basically you should, there are certain milestone events that happen in people's lifetimes that would warrant a review. Now, again, this is at the basic level, not the more complex level as where most of my clients are. But those types of things are deaths, births, marriages, divorces, you come into a lot of money, you lose a lot of money. Maybe your kids are now that were minors are now maybe age of majority. Maybe the people that you have as your fiduciaries making decisions for you, you no longer like them. You no longer have a relationship with them. They've kind of stepped out. Um, you moved to kind of like me, I'm the lawyer in California. I'm now in Nevada. So I've had to rearrange the people in my life and my fiduciaries because some people are more local than others. So, so assuming any of those categories itself, Josh would warrant a review, but if everything stays normal, I say, if you're completely boring and life just stays completely normal, five years is pretty much the time that you should at least visit it. Because again, it touches so many different areas, not only the plan, but also the asset makeup. I mean, Josh, think about your, your listener base. How different are people today than they will be five years from now? Or how different are they today than they were five years ago, right? So just, just based upon this life asset, um, different political administrations, um, you know, economies, um, opportunities that kind of come up. So you have an asset issue, which gives different asset issues, different liability issues. Um, and then how that plays in to their overall plan as well. So that's the five year mark, just, just as a housekeeping point of view. Now, if your plan gets older than that, now you're going seven years, 10 years. And again, I've seen ones that are 20 years old. And again, I'm talking people that are champions of commerce and the country from all over the country. It's still written on, uh, it's still a typewritten on, you know, it's not even on a, printed on a laser printer. I mean, it's like, it's, it's old. 
or some people do what's called a holographic will. They'll try to write something out. These things can cause problems because the way that the laws were written and they were drafted probably correctly for their time. But as I mentioned, laws change the government, both federal and state legislators can't keep their hands off the estate area of things. And I think primarily because dead people don't vote. And so you're able to kind of manipulate and go after people because you have a lot less repercussions. And a lot of people aren't paying attention to the estate side of things. They're worried about income taxes or social security or where the benefits may be coming from, or is a 1031 exchange still gonna be exist? Or am I making 400,000? What does that mean 400,000? But meantime, behind the scenes, someone's messing around with the estate taxes and the laws in that effect. And so there, if you have a document that was drafted correctly in its time, it's not valid now. And I, and what I mean by how it hurts people, I've seen unintentional disinheritance of spouses. Oh, I've seen unintentional disinheritance of kids. I've seen assets going off to former spouses, um, um, kids who predeceased and it goes to their surviving spouses and the grandkids are getting nothing simply because it's not kept up. And to answer your question, had they done nothing, there is every state in the country has some built in, we call it the intestate statutes, mm -hmm. some schematic of who receives it pretty much goes by representation. Like you would think you got three kids, you divide a third, a third, a third down to the grandchildren. You would think that's the way most people would want it. And if you, if you don't have a plan and that's what you plan on happening, it may be the long way, it may be the expensive way, but ultimately it may settle out okay for the family. But if you did something that's so old that doesn't account for families and kids and taxes, you may be worse off because that's still the effective document. And had you done nothing, at least it would have been somewhat in the realm of what you wanted as opposed to what you have. It's a long answer, but that's an accurate answer. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Dead people don't vote. Dead people don't vote. <laughs> and, they, and they don't get to change their mind. Right? <laughs> hey, that's funny. That's funny. I don't care who you are right now. That's funny. <laughs> dead people don't vote. Uh, and if you do see a dead person vote, you might want to recount. Um, <laughs> super interesting. Uh, that's funny. Um, another side uh, rabbit trail. What's the weirdest thing you've seen in an estate plan or a living will or not a living will like a will it's just like hey i've got this bucket of money but has some strings attached you must do oh, this do that oh, go to this oh. school or whatever yeah you know something and what you're referring to are in incentive provisions you know you have to go to this school you have to go you know live in this state you know it's you know i really i don't want to say so much i've seen anything weird because most of what we've seen are people who really just want the best for the family you go to this particular college you maintain this gpa or you have this particular job um, will match your gross your w2 gross income after the end of the year so that's pretty pretty common i'm not a big fan of these incentive provisions and i'll tell you the reason why um, which also ties into what i'm assuming we'll get to eventually is some of the asset protection talks is because I'm also, not only am I a planner, but I'm also a professional trustee. As a lawyer, I'm also a trustee. I do trust administration. I do trust in the state's litigation. So I'm very, I'm very close to this area. And then when you put incentive provisions inside documents, what you've really done is you've kind of tied the hands of the trustee who you designated in a role to be able to exercise his or, hold, his or her discretion for the benefit of the beneficiary. And sometimes beneficiaries can do something purely by being motivated by the economics behind it and not so much truly feel it in their heart. Whatever, whatever value that Gen 1 is trying to transmit to Gen 2 by putting those incentive provisions in there, some people will just do the bare minimum just to kind of to get to get the money without without really without living the model that you're trying to that you're trying to set. So what I would rather, rather than seeing these incentive provisions, um, I'd rather see what we, what we refer to as wholly discretionary provisions uh, in, the in the name of the trustee. Now, what you should do is you should now have what's called a letter of wishes, right? Now, this is kind of, I think, a better way of, rather than putting these wacky things inside the document, which compels the trustee to abide by them and also allows 
the beneficiary to manipulate the circumstances, right? Because you got two, you got two sides of the same coin. One side, the trustee, is trying to protect and preserve the trust assets for the benefit of the beneficiary and potentially future generations. And you got the beneficiary who's trying to grab as much money out of this thing as possible, <laughs> right? You got, and they both have a copy of the same document, right? And so you, which can, which can lend itself um, to create litigation and contests. Whereas if you left everything in the trustee's discretion, and then you give them, I call it the, the side letter, right? Dear trustee, for the trustee's eyes only, right? This is the place, to me, this is best practice. This is the place because it's not legally enforceable. And this is the place where you would say, okay, trustee, I want my kids to be involved in education. I want them to start a business. I want them to invest in real estate. I want them to have a, a nice first wedding, not a second wedding. I want them to have this kind of car. This is kind of where you're putting in your value. I want them to give the charity. I want them to be involved in the community. And you're putting all this stuff up in a letter that first of all is for the trustee's eyes only and not the beneficiary because Josh, if you think about it, when you designate someone to be the trustee of the family um, legacy for the benefit of your kids, and if it's a third party or even if it's a family member, you really don't want the trustee exercising their discretion. What you really want is the trustee exercising your discretion, but you're not there to advise the trustee. So either you have a long-term relationship with that trustee, so they know what you meant when you said healthcare and education and support. Um, but if, but if you don't, then you have that letter, which is kind of a kind of a roadmap as to how you to best advise it. So rather than putting these crazy wacky provisions and incentive provisions there, which I really haven't seen really wacky ones, um, I just seen your traditional ones. I prefer to be the side letter. And, um, and I think that's the, probably the best and most prudent way to go about it. It's better for everybody, for, you know, the trustee and also for the beneficiary. So I've seen this a lot, right? I used to be, uh, I've been in business for, for a long time, but I've also been in the healthcare field as a firefighter medic. And I've seen a lot of death, right? Death is a natural thing. Currently the mortality rates close to a hundred, right? If I'm counting, right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we're, we're all, we're all going to die. Right. <laughs> hundred percent. hundred percent. None of us get out of here alive. That's how I like to put it. Yeah. <laughs> I have seen a lot of wonky stuff and, and the thoughts of like the, the, the parents of it's okay. My kids will figure this out on their own. Right. I've seen that tear apart, you know, friends of mine and their families. I've seen that tear apart estates. I've seen them spend more money on attorneys trying to fight for what's left than trying to figure out how to preserve the, the rest of it. Like what is the best way to, to approach this. I'm assuming it's having a conversation with an estate planner prior to get right. the wishes of the parent, right? Right. Yeah. When does it go bad, right? So an out of date one is one. When else can it go really bad? Okay. You, you, you basically already articulated it. I'll just kind of rephrase it from a, from a, from a practice point of view. Um, and I'll give, I give you the example that when I'm drafting a plan and I've seen this and so this, so the good, the bad, and the ugly, I call it a, a very lazy estate plan. Somebody will come to me with their trust. You know, it's got whatever, $5 million of assets in it. If there's two kids, my brother and sister, and they're the beneficiaries and they're the trustees. And so you ask, you start asking some probing questions during review or when you're drafting a plan, you say to the, you say to the client, the trust maker, and you say, well, do the kids, do the kids get along? Right. Um, and you say, well, no, they don't No, they, yeah, they get along. Okay. But then, but then you say, but just to your point, but then for somehow in their mind, they think, oh, but this, but this money and this control will somehow bring them together and make them work together, make them happy. And that's completely the contrary. Not only do they not get along or talk or have open communication while mom and dad are alive, wait until mom and dad are gone, as you said. And then you add the emotions on that. Silent waters run very, very deep. And then on top of that, you also put money and control and power in there. And like you said, it's a recipe for civil war. And I've seen this, Josh, when people are in their 50s and their 60s years old, and they say, listen, do you remember the time you ran over my Raggedy Ann doll when you were eight years old, right? It's payback time because I'm in charge. And that, and I'm not kidding, that comes up. And what happens is you even have contests and spites, and all you do is you've created this litigation cauldron that's getting stirred and stirred and stirred by them, and it's a complete disaster. But yet, the way that you solve it is very simple. You simply put a third party independent trustee in there. 
And now some people come back and say, wait a second, I don't want to have that third party trust. I don't want to pay for that third party trustee. And most of them, whether they're banks or they're professional fiduciaries, accountants, uh, attorneys, whatever, you can basically bet at about 1%, some a little high, some a little low, because there's typically a scale that's based upon the overall value. But that 1% uh, that you pay a professional fiduciary solves all your problems. Because I look at my sister and I, I have one sister, Amy, and rather than Amy and I, and I drafted my dad's plan, so which was for both of our benefits. So I, I'd rather than me being in control of Amy and Amy and I being kind of tied together, making decisions together, I'd much rather call my sister up and say, hey, Amy, let's go harass Wells Fargo today and see if we can squeeze some money out of them. So I'd much rather have a partnership with my sister yeah. and a going after a third party than as opposed to my sister and I being in civil war, because at the end of that, Josh, and this is the moral of the story, at the end of that, the money, the legacy is long gone, but that relationship is, is permanently destroyed, right? Yeah. So mom and dad's attempt to do something nice for the kids, to leave them a legacy and an inheritance actually did the complete opposite. It actually tore the family apart for lack of planning. So that's, so I think that's kind of what you were getting at. And I agree with you hundred percent, but I think the solution is simple. I, it's, it's so well articulated and I've seen this, my own family, it's keep it in the family, right? Like nobody's yep. getting, nobody right. else is allowed to see what we've got under the covers. Right. right. And I think it's harmful because you put sister and brother, you put someone in charge, they're going right. to be attacked and they're no right. longer in a position of partnership. Now they have to figure out right. how to do all this crap that I've never done before That's in my right. life. That's right. That's right. And the best thing you can do is, is inject a professional in there, even if you have it in a co-fiduciary relationship. So that way it's at least you have some, I kind of like who's guarding the guard, kind of like a, like a referee in there to kind of help, help out with the professional, someone that's insured, someone that can kind of keep the ball moving. Someone can make sure things are accounted for correctly. Things are disclosed appropriately because that's really, as long as you have the disclosures, the timeline and things are moving along, um, it, it, it goes fine. And if that's, and that's worth more than 1%, because remember the trust needs to be invested. So let's just say, and you, and you can speak of this from an investment point of view, yeah. most trusts should be at least equaling three, four, 5% at a minimum. I mean, that's basic. So if the trustee is doing his or her job, they're earning you know, three or 4% just on the, on the, on the trust. And that's not what doing any kind anything more aggressive they've already made their 1% back, okay? Because they've already, and then when you take in the cost of litigation, the cost of the fights and disputes, that cost will far exceed the 1% that you would ever pay. So you got to kind of, sometimes you got to, you got to kind of, I just know you got to clock the client in the head and just give them a reality check and say, listen, don't fret so much about the 1%. Think about the benefit that that 1% is providing for you, yeah. right? And it's, uh, have you ever seen in your 24 years of doing it and your dad's 78 long, years of doing right, it, right? A long, long time. Long, right, a long time. <laughs> have you ever seen out of the probably thousands of cases, have you right. ever seen a situation where maybe something wasn't clear, you know, rent, you know, printed out or whatever, or expressed parents die and the kids get together and they go, let's do what's fair. And everybody hold hands, sing Kumbaya and a fair deal came out of it. Have you ever Abs seen that? Absolutely. And thank God that's the majority oh, of the God. cases. Absolutely. Yeah. And, but, and, but, but I, w and I would say the majority I'm saying, let's just say more than 50%, but probably less than 75%, right? So, cause it's, it's, it's uh, most families are actually pretty reasonable. But, it, but there are a lot of families, especially as families get larger and you have maybe just two kids that may be fine. You start getting three, four, five, six kids involved in assets in different states and everyone has different economic and socioeconomic positions. Um, it gets more complicated. But most of the time, Josh, um, when you have an equal division among the kids, and that's the majority of them also, it's equal among the kids, um, absent maybe a charitable beneficiary as well. Most of the times they, they kind of figure it out. And sometimes they may need a little, a little guidance, maybe a little uh, you know, sage and Solomonic advice as to how to properly allocate it. But ultimately everyone, most cases, it works out to be okay. And it doesn't have to be so clearly spelled out. You just need one magic word, equally, equally among my descendants or something. And once you have that word equally in there, now it's a matter of how do they want to horse trade among themselves um, as far as the assets. But at the end of the day, 
they should kind of work out equally. So thankfully, I would say that most most cases um, it works out okay. But you can look, pull up what in the old days used to be the yellow pages, and nowadays is go on Google it and look at how many trust and estates litigation or uh, attorneys that are out there. Um, and you'll see that doesn't always work out so well um, because there's, there's a lot of area for uh, discrepancies and a lot of areas for challenge. Um, but, but, and that's the stuff that kind of makes the news. But thankfully, the majority of my experience with my clients over the years, it, it works out. Okay, it works out. That's yeah. good, man. Yeah. That's hopeful. Easy. I thought the answer was going to be like, nope, everybody fights. <laughs> nope, no, they, you know, not to say that those guys don't fight, but that's yeah. where they, maybe one of them would reach out for some advice, like a tiebreaker or something, but that's because they're trying to keep peace within that home, within that family structure. Yeah. So they're smart enough and reasonable enough to maybe bring in, let's say a coach to kind of help walk them through, um, as opposed to just absolutely rifting the relationship and just a lawyering up from, from day one. So I'm not to say that there it's it's perfect. It's never perfect. Yeah. It's never perfect. But ultimately, people do seem to work it out in the long run, right? Yeah. There's 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 a lot of shades of gray in that question, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So we've got, you know, the goal of us business builders, or at least for me, I want to build something. I want to yep. make a lot of money. I want to keep as much of it as possible. Right. I want that money to make a lot of money. And then I want to give my kids an opportunity that I didn't have, but I want them to earn it. Right. So with that, like out of those things, like what are you most passionate about talking about, speaking about, and maybe even applying to your own family life? Sure. Sure. Those, those, there's two parts to that uh, answer. And the first part would be the asset protection part, the preserving what you're working for. And then the second part of that question is the stewardship question, which, which you've asked. Yeah. So the first part of it on an asset protection and legacy part is, you're right, we all, we all are working, we all are investing, we all, are, wanna, we all wanna make money. And to your point, we all wanna keep the money that we make. You know, we already have um, the world's most aggressive predator, uh, our, our silent partner, the, the tax man, the IRS, or whomever your local state uh, uh, taxing authorities are. So we're already dealing with that. And a lot of people are familiar with that and they work with their CPAs, try to maximize and minimize their overall taxes. So we're familiar with dealing with that. But what happens is that, and even if you're working with a CPA to minimize your taxes, maybe you're, you're, you're getting like a one or 2% differential. Or to your point, you're changing your different investment portfolios. Do you wanna go from the 4% to the 8%? Okay, that's a, that's a 4% delta, that's a 4% differential. But what happens though, if you wind up getting into a lawsuit, say one of your rental properties has a problem and you have a tenant that sues you, or you get into a car accident, or you have some other business-based liability, professional liability, employee-related liability, your liabilities are not limited to 1% differentials. Now you're looking at 30, 40, 50, 6 per 60% mm. of your overall net worth that could be affected. And like you said, I just want to make a living and get on and be able to have something to give to my kids. So this is where the asset protection component of your overall financial plan is an absolute necessity. And this is the second part of the question you asked me, what's the, what surprises you the most in the business world? The first thing I told you is that estate planning, people simply don't have it. And the second thing is they haven't done anything to give themselves financial self-defense should a liability arise, regardless whether it's a personal-based liability or a business-generated liability. So that's, that's my answer to number one, is my real passion is working with my clients in, uh, in, in helping them preserve and protect what they're working so hard uh, to achieve. Because you ask me myself personally, I'm like you, I'm out here, I'm hustling, I'm trying to make a living. And ultimately, I, it, the dollars that I earn, Josh, represent more than just an, an economic power. It represents, it represents me, who I am, everything I've done, everything I've worked for, my life, my education, my discipline, my persistence. That's what that dollar represents. It's part of who you are. And, I, and you should protect that and you should value that as much as you protect anything else that you work so hard for. So that's kind of my passion deals with protecting people because there are a lot of bad people out there. The simply is the have nots want to take from the haves. And for some reason, be it political or media or otherwise, there seems to be a thing that if you have something, 
you must be a crook. You you must have it. It's you can easily can take it away from you. Okay, of course you can give it away to somebody else, and that's not the case. We all work very very hard. So whenever I can help my clients survive these type of attacks on their wealth, that makes me feel great. That's that's a that's a success. The second part of your question dealt with stewardship issues. Um, I, how do I help my clients to kind of with their legacy and educate their own families? Um, and this has to do with you know, I have four kids and my oldest is 24 and my youngest is uh, eight. And, um, you know, I always said that when my kids are young, little kids make little mistakes and big kids make big mistakes. Right. Yeah. Right. And so it's no different than when we're kind of when we're trying to teach our kids from a legacy point of view. If you give a kid six dollars and they blow it, that's a little kid, little mistake. You give someone sixty thousand dollars and they blow it. That's a medium mistake. You give somebody a $6 million inheritance and they blow it, that's a big mistake. And because it's the lack of stewardship and training and discussion and being open-minded with your kids, assuming they're financially mature, um, to have that. So I think a, an important part of the planning deals with financial stewardship as well. And then also, that's also based on your, on, on your kids' financial maturity. And there are ways that we can design that into the plan. Um, besides just a normal conversation that you could have with your kids, right? So, you know, yeah, that's kind of, I think that's kind of a, I think I'm kind of, that's my response to that. <laughs> I like it. I thought it was, that it was great, man. Um, on financial self-defense, yep. tactically, yep. what can we do? There's 87,000 new people coming to knock on our door, the, the silent partners. There's, there's a lot of them coming to yep. knock on our door. What can we do to protect ourselves, yep. protect our assets and uh, do what's, right right by our constitution and such but like what can we do to make wise decisions solomaic okay. decisions as you perfect said. great these are great great question uh you just have to understand that the legal system that we have here um works both as a sword and also works as a shield so the same legal system that gives plaintiffs and plaintiffs attorneys the sword to steal your wealth is the exact same legal system that gives our clients the ability to protect their wealth, All right? So you have to, and a lot of people say it's, 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 it's unfair. I'm always on the defensive. Well, that's because there may be a little bit of a lack of planning, a little lack of foresight. So from a, from a asset protection point of view, the tools that we use vary depending upon the client. So to answer the question, I always say that there's, there's no one silver bullet for, for everybody. Everyone's individual facts Need to be looked at because josh some assets have inherently built in protections and some assets don't and so how we plan for those assets are very different so look at the assets individual vulnerability so for example take um take a like a 401k plan a retirement plan based upon its own structuring and law based upon what's called erisa it has tremendous built-in asset protection I don't have to worry too much about that in most circumstances, but then you take a look over at someone's cash, right? You're sitting here with half a million dollars in your Wells Fargo bank account or whomever bank account, that's completely exposed, right? So one asset is inherently protected because the federal government gave you the protection and one asset is completely exposed and basically you might as well put it out in the front lawn if someone wants to take it away from you. So we have to look at the client's assets because there may be some type of vulnerability just based on that. And then you always have to consider who's coming after that asset because how we deal with a contingency fee lawyer, a regulator or taxing authority, a government entity versus a private case, you know, they all have different strengths and we have to design it accordingly. So you got to look at the assets, look at the assets inherent vulnerabilities or strengths, who's coming after that. Now, once we know that, now you can start building your fortress and they can be a, a variety of LLCs, they could be corporations, it could be limited partnerships, they could be trusts, they could be domestic trusts, they could be international asset protection trusts. So once we know what the asset makeup is, and we know who the potential invaders are to that. Now we look at our toolkit and start putting together the appropriate firewalls around there. So it's uh, like it's beyond the scope of this discussion to kind of get into it. But let's just say that every every case is different. It's not a it's not a 
you know, buy my box, my, 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 uh, my, my, my book on the way out the door and it will solve all your problems. That's not it. That's, that's not a professional nor responsible way of going about it. It's going through an analysis and uh, reviewing it and coming up with a plan. And that plan, Josh, may only be good, as I said, what I say about, about five years, because there may be changes in that. You may grow, you may downsize. You, you know, so that plan needs to be flexible enough and also allow you still to work with your lenders and your business partners and your sureties. And it can't be so rigid that you can't function, right? So it's, 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 it is a proper balance. There definitely is an art to what we do. The art of, let's the see. The art the, of asset protection, yeah. Asset vulnerability, the sword and the shield. Protect, sword and the I shield. <laughs> I like this. Love it. <laughs> now, you, as we're talking, right, we're talking about vulnerabilities, and you're looking at someone, you know, someone comes, I come to you and I go, hey, man, here's my asset portfolio. Here's here's how much money I have in the bank. Here's my kids. Here's what's going on in my world. Yep. I'm 40 years old. And you start taking a look you have a natural skepticism that there's going to be people that want to take this from me, right? Yes. Admittedly. Yes. Which is great because I, I, I will overlook that or it might not even occur in my brain. And yeah. that's why I love partnering with people who think differently than me. Right. Yeah. Um, let's ask this question with that. When has that really saved your own butt? Okay. So because, and I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to put anybody at, at fear. But um, I have a lot of clients that are business owners, as I, as I previously mentioned, and uh, and, and I always say that this is the rule of three. I'm not. I'm sure you've discussed this or had other people discuss it with you. That most people that are wealthy have a third, a third, a third. You have cash, business, and real estate. That's kind of the three your three legged stool of of, of really making uh, being wealthy in America. And so, if you have your your investments is one leg. Your business operation is the second leg and the third leg is, is real estate. That's kind of where you come in. And a lot of my clients also have that large real estate portfolio. And that's also, unfortunately, the largest source of my clients' liabilities because a lot of what happens is things that you can't control. Your gold bullion is not going to sue you, right? Your savings bond is not going to sue you. When, how you operate your business, you kind of control some of that stuff and you have insurances and things like that. So you kind of control as a prudent business person, you kind of control your own, in, you kind of self-insure your risks. But when it comes to real estate portfolios, you have, you have investments in, in people on the land that you really don't control. Them, their activities, their kids, their girlfriends, their boyfriends, their pit bulls, you know, the activities on there. So you don't necessarily control that. And that winds up being the largest source of liability. And how has that affected me? Well, I had a, I did have a rental property for uh, a couple of years. And Josh, it was probably, see all the gray in my beard here we talked about? You know, the gray. Yeah. I, all of it had to come from having that rental <laughs> property for a couple of years. Only, and believe me, I had that thing so wrapped up in tight protection structure. There wasn't, there wasn't a, a chance that I would have any liability, but it's always in the back of my head because this is what I do for a living. I'm not, I'm not Disneyland dad, as you said. It's like sometimes my own paranoia because of what I work with really has hindered my, my going into, in certain directions and in certain investment areas. So th that to me is probably the area that, uh, that has affected me personally based upon my, on my own experiences. So. <laughs> yeah, super cool. I love I love hearing from deal makers. I love hearing the way they think and how they apply it to business, right? Like, so for me, I'm very venture based, right? Like high risk. I'll I'll go yeah. out and I'll take a bunch of risk. I'll fail 99 out of 100 times. The one works out well, and I'm right. set, right? So but, those risks, so those risks. And I'm sorry to cut you off, but I'll yeah. I'll address it really quickly because and those risks are great, and there's nothing wrong with that. But see, what you said is that you knew that there was risks. And so when you know that there's risks, you have to just insulate yourself because you're moving forward with eyes wide open. Now, and that's, and that's fine. And that's the legal system acting as a shield. You're aggressive. You want to pursue, hey, man, no risk, no reward. But the no risk doesn't mean that you have to lose your home or your life savings, yeah. right? The risk is I'm willing to risk this. And let's, let's limit, let's limit my potential liabilities. The challenge is that you have people that go, that go all in with the risk, but they, they forget about the, 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 the protecting themselves, the liability side of things, 
right? So that's that's a great it's a great takeaway, right? So I'm not trying to discourage you or your or your listeners from aggressively pursuing whatever their passion is. Just just don't go into it blindly, right? Just be, there, there is a right way to do things. There is a right way to invest in real estate. There is a right way to invest in businesses. Yeah. Well, the, the what I'm what I'm seeing is I have blind spots. When you're running forward fast right, and right. doing, you know, trying to do a bunch, I have blind spots. Right. I love talking with attorneys and CPAs and and estate planners and all all these groups because I go, I have blind spots. Help cover my ass, right? Like right. help help me right. go faster. Right. So then when I'm in bed, I'm not worrying about what's behind right. me. Right. And that's that's exactly right. And that's and that's just having a partnership with a professional and, and, and that's regardless of what it is, whether it's a legal professional, yeah. tax professional, real estate investment professional, hundred percent. And I have a, I call these our big, our big drivers. Every industry has big drivers who just push, 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 push. And thank God we have them because those are the people that kind of make, that make society what it is. That's how we develop. Those are the, the Elon Musk's of the world. They're pushing, pushing and pushing. Mm -hmm. Okay. But at the same time, they need to surround themselves with the, with the professionals to make sure that as they're pushing through, someone needs to be back there kind of collecting the wake, making sure that they're kind of, they're under control so that uh, they can do what they do uh, without, uh, without the whole house of cards tumbling down on them. I love it, man. Yeah. Um, let me ask this question for, for our listeners. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to ask, you know, where, where can people go to connect with you and do a deal and, and, you know, get some advice from you, but what are some resources that you think, Hey, Maybe you're not ready to talk to someone, but here's some resources. What what are some good places where people could start going self-educating? Great, yeah. So, as you know, the internet is full of all kinds of great information. So, but I, I always kind of say that they call it the information superhighway, but it could also be the information wasteland. As far as you know, it, it's both ways. But I can tell you that there is a great amount of information if you just type in asset protection planners in your state. Lawyers are very kind in putting up a lot of good practical information and various newsletters on their website, helping to advertise them. Um, there are a, a bunch of books that are written out there that you can look on Amazon, whatever, that are all great resources. There is a lot of excellent information in the areas of asset protection and also in the areas of estate planning. The only problem with that, and this is just, okay, that you, you don't necessarily know how to filter out the information and not everything that you're reading may be applicable to your circumstance. And many times when I've been, people do go out there and self-educate Josh, and then they, they do come to me. I actually spend more time with them actually having to uneducate them so we can re-educate them because they got all the ideas up in their head, but they're just, they're like spaghetti. It's just like all over the place. And we need to turn them into honeycombs, right? You need nice little organized compartments and they're just total spaghetti brain. And so, we, so, I, so it's great information, but it should not be in lieu of working with an advisor. Educate yourself so you can have an informed and intelligent conversation with your advisor for sure. But don't, don't use these resources as a supplement uh, or in lieu of working with a professional. Okay, how about yeah. that? Okay. That's yeah, but there's there's tons of stuff out there. I mean, tons. I got I got I'm my bookshelf. There's tons tons of stuff. And it's it's and also um, there's no there's no um, there's no um, replacement for experience. And that's kind of why I like to kind of uh, mention my years of practice because those 24 years of practice come sometimes difficult with difficult years. Right? You get you get ground up. You get chewed up. But you know what? Like you said, it makes you bigger, better, and better for the next time, right? You said that you may do 100 deals and 99 fails. I say, wait a second. You've done, a 90, you've done 100 deals, and you've learned 99 ways not to do it the next time. That's exactly. all, right? Yeah. So it's, it's like it's, that you've learned, and you've made so that the next time is going to be better. Someone that hasn't done those 100 deals, they're still doing the one, two, three fail, right? And have, and, but you're already at that. I know exactly what I do and I know what works because you had all these learning experiences. And that only comes by being dragged through the dirt a couple of times, you know, and having to go to court and getting chewed up by, by other attorneys. And I've been on the receiving end of depositions myself for these reasons. And, you, and all these life lessons make you a better planner. So you always need to work with people that are seasoned in the area that you're focused on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I, I love that explanation. Uh, a few more questions for you before sure. we uh, wrap no up today. You have uh, you have a few kids ranging from twenty four to eight. Which is your favorite? 
No, I'm just kidding. Don't I, answer. I, that. No, I'll, I'll answer that. I, I I have my favorite first daughter. I have my favorite second daughter. I have my favorite third daughter, and I have my favorite son. <laughs> so, hey, we got a boy in there. Awesome. Boy. <laughs> my favorite first son. So the, there you go. There's your answer. <laughs> hey, all right. So let's just say you know they're listening in the future. You got a 24 and you got an eight year old. So let's let's fast forward a few years. And uh, let's say they, they're dusting off the a cover of a podcast, whatever, and they hear this interview and you could pass off one piece of advice to your kids in the future. You're no longer here. What advice, what advice or piece of wisdom oh. Oh, or boy. character that you want to pass off to them? Oh boy, Josh, I didn't prepare for that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, I think, and I actually, I, I, I well, this, what just came to mind is something I told my, my nephews. Um, when they graduated from from college, um, and I told them, I told them, I said, whatever you do in life, in whatever direction that you do, whatever direction you go, um, just make sure that it, you're happy in what you're doing, and you're and, and it's rewarding in what you're doing, because having to wake up every single day, being on the the treadmill of life as we all go through that in our 30s and our 40s and on myself even into our 50s, if you have to wake up and you hate what you do, but you got to do it to make a paycheck, that's, that's not a life. That's a miserable way of living. So ultimately, whatever you decide to do, just make sure that you get some personal fulfillment, enjoyment out of it. It doesn't mean that you have to be the next uh, Elon Musk's of the world. I don't care if you're a social worker. As long as you're getting personal satisfaction out of it, and ultimately you're going to leave this world better as a result of you being here than it was before you got here, I think that's probably the best thing I could tell my kids. Yeah, that's that's real happiness, right? Like yep. I've chased money and you know packed up the family a bunch of times and chasing money, yep. and uh, and it wound up not even working, right? Like out of the ninety nine, yep. and uh, but when I find myself I'm doing what I love doing, yep. rewards follow that. Yeah. I see, yeah. yep. right? And that's kind of what I was mentioning to you earlier. One of the nice things about having done this as long as I've done this and and speaking about this for as long as I've spoken about this. It's that I get great validation because I'm helping people keep what they work for. And when they do have that inevitable lawsuit, because of our planning, they're much better off as a result of the planning than they were without it. Litigation wise, succession wise, estate planning wise. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing feeling to know that I made a difference in their ultimate outcome with regardless of what it is, right? And then we get many, many kind letters um, to us saying that, no, thanks for all the, all the good thoughts. Um, and, uh, you know, and, that, and that's very rewarding. That's very rewarding. Are you in office or home, like whatever location you're in? The nice thing is, is that um, I was in office for, I lived, I lived in California for 34 years. Um, and um, uh, as a result of, of COVID, and this is in California, in Orange County, where our office is located. And as a result of COVID, I found myself sitting in my home office, very much like this, um, saying to myself, you know, um, let's see if we can we can we can relocate. And we and we did. We wound up. We were and we were considering going out of state uh, in prior years for a ver variety of reasons. California is a difficult place as far as quality of life, as far as tax basis, um, and back to that treadmill, right? You, you make a lot of money, but I ain't got two nickels at the end of the month. And that's just because that's that, that's that, that's that California lifestyle. It's very expensive. Um, and so when we had an opportunity to move, we wound up moving to Las Vegas and it has a lot. And, and, un, and like a lot of people, I always thought of Las Vegas as, as one street, Las Vegas Boulevard. <laughs> that was my, that was Las Vegas. But in reality, it's a whole, it's a whole city. Yeah. It's, it's actually very nice places to live in Las Vegas. And now a different quality of life, different tax bases, things like that. Um, and so as a result of that, I now work 100% from home. This is now my home office. I do go back to California. One of the reasons why we chose Las Vegas, it's only a four hour, three hour and 50 minute uh, drive uh, from where I am. So every every so often, maybe at once a quarter, I do go back in. It's kind of, I have some clients that do want to see me. My daughter is still there. My parents are still there. You know, you still kind of check in, but uh, but I'm kind of like the I'm kind of like that virtual lawyer. But thankfully now with all this modern technology between Zooms and emails, you know, if you're working with me, if I'm sitting here in Nevada or I'm sitting in Kathmandu, it doesn't make much of a difference now, but we do have a complete sub, uh, staff of 31 people at the office um, in California well, for fulfillment and meetings. And so we're still a full functioning um, uh, uh, law firm with full support. Just I myself happen to be located here in Nevada and, and thankfully. 
I think it's awesome. Oh, that's think, great. Yeah, yeah, I think that's great. Um, yeah. You're going to keep moving further east until you land in Florida, like the you rest know, of the California. That, Sorry, it, depends, it depends on where my kids wind up. You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> it's like, I'm going to chase my kids and grandkids, wherever they wind up in the country. That's where I'm going to wind up. So, but right now yeah. I'm very happy where we're located. Brilliant, brilliant. Brad, like during this interview, there's probably something that I should have asked you that I screwed up and did not ask. What question should I have asked you? Uh, probably, uh, the, uh, probably the last, the last question is how to, how to get in contact with me. <laughs> that's my <laughs> last question. Uh, no, that's the last question. <laughs> so Brad, where can people go to connect with you okay. and do a deal? Okay, great. So let me, let me give you, uh, we have one, one way of getting for, for this particular podcast, we have one way of getting in contact with us and kind of just because of the volume of, of contacts that we have, we want to make sure we have to streamline people getting in contact with us. So there's actually a, it's actually a text. Uh, you have to text uh, to a help me, H E L P M E help me. And the phone number, if you may want to put this up in the chat or maybe in the show comments, uh, help me H E L P M E. And the number is six, five, zero, four five nine two seven one two again text help me that's all one word to six five zero four five nine two seven one two and that way you're able we'll have our team kind of be able to get everyone on the calendar so they can speak with me if they so desire and that's probably the probably the best way to get in contact with us. Very cool. Fellow deal makers in the audience, as always, reach out to our guests and say, hey, I need some help or I'm looking to do a de looking to do a deal. Man, blah, blah. Right. So as always, reach out to our guests, say thank you. And uh, you could text help me to six five zero four five nine two seven one two to connect directly with Brad and his team. Um, now, if you guys have a deal that you'd like to talk about it here on the show, head over to thedealscout.com, fill out a quick form, maybe get you on the show next. Till then, we'll talk to you all on the next episode. See you guys.